everyone, this is Mia, your life and performance coach, and welcome to the Actually You Can podcast. Actually You Can is more than just a fun phrase to say. It's a philosophy of limitless potential, a mindset, an attitude, a conviction. Most importantly, it's about to make you achieve what you might never have thought possible. On this show, we discuss strategies for growth for ambitious individuals looking to achieve big things and live a thriving, fulfilled life. You'll hear from inspiring guests who will share their journeys, challenges, and lessons learned. And I'll be sharing insights and actionable takeaways from my Aligned Results Framework that will help you to align your goals, mindset, and strategy to reach your highest potential. Be sure to hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to so you can easily find this podcast again and stay updated with new episodes dropping every week. Today, we're talking about honoring core values with Andrea Johnson, a transformational leadership coach with over 30 years of experience empowering female leaders. In this episode, we explore the transformative impact of honoring core values in both professional and personal spheres. And Andrea guides us through the process of and Andrea guides us through the process of uncovering our core values. So without further ado, let's jump to it. It's so wonderful to have you on the show, Andrea. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you. I am always eager to talk to somebody new about core values and to learn more about you and your audience. This is going to be good. And so you've just touched on it. We are going to talk about core values today, and it's a subject that is deeply are close to my heart as I know it is yours. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Before we dive deep into that, I'd love to learn a little bit more about yourself. If you wouldn't mind sharing a bit about yourself, your business, what you do with the listeners. Sure. I don't mind at all. Again, my name is Andrea Johnson and I am a transformational leadership coach. Basically what that means is I empower female leaders specifically to kind of change the culture and define it differently by thinking critically, like trusting themselves to think critically, to create imaginatively, and to um, lead effectively. Yeah. And so what role has core values played in your life? How did you get into this work? Oh, gosh. I've, this is the second time I've done this. I took, I have a little, are you familiar with the Franklin Covey system, the Franklin Planner system? I am not. I would love to learn more. Okay. So, gosh, I wish I had my my piece of paper with me. But um, this was years ago. Like, there are lots of planners out there, day planners. And Franklin Covey actually came out as the Franklin Planner System years and years ago. I'm going to date myself. This is way back in the early 90s. And I was in grad school, and I was looking for a way to really, like, hone in on being super efficient. And so I got this system, and it's one of those six-ring binders, and there's all the different you, you mark it this way and you move things there and you do this, that, and the other, and you have a special thing for, for the, the center. And it, it's, it's a racket if you're not going to use it because it's this much stuff. I mean, it's like an ama- amazing amount of stuff. And the binders are like three inches thick. And um, I, there's books that go along with it. Um, Stephen Covey, who is the Seven Habits guy, um, either bought them out or merged with them. And so as soon as that happened, we started getting Covey information with that. And so I started going through a Covey book and decided I needed to define my governing values. And that's a little different than what I would define core values as today. But I came up with nine and it was a process that I did 30 years ago that literally kind of changed the way I looked at what was important because I was raised... um, I'm a missionary kid and I am currently and have been for almost 30 years a pastor's wife. And so in that kind of a situation, it's or an or an environment, it's very easy to take on the values of the and the systems around you that tell you this is how you're supposed to act. These are the things you are supposed to think are important. And this is how you're supposed to believe about certain things. Um, but something in me said, I don't function that way. <laughs> And so I started saying, well, what is important to me? And that started a 30-year process of in and out of looking at core values. But it was, it really came to a head about five years ago when I was, became certified as a John Maxwell team coach, speaker trainer and coach, and a DISC consultant that I started really looking at true core values again. And I found that list and said, okay, some of these things are beliefs. Some of these things fall outside of me, but there's a few of them that are really my core values. And so I walked through a simple exercise that I still share with people 
and I've been now capitalized, not capitalized on it. I've, um, I've drilled down on the process, made it a lot more defined. And I actually d- did a whole workshop this last Friday with our local chamber of commerce. They have a leader's lab and I taught the curriculum on values. And so I, I work with within organizations with individuals who then take it to their teams, who then uh, take it out to help that actually helps them figure out their mission and vision of their organization. Or I work with individuals just kind of figuring out their own. And so it's been a long journey, but I, and I don't feel like I know everything. (laughs) I feel like I have plenty to learn and it's such a rich topic. And a lot of people, I think it's getting a lot of attention out there right now. A lot of people are talking about it. And so I, for me, I want to make sure that I define it in a way that makes sense for what the discussion we're having and not the way someone else describes it because core values for your organization are different than your core values. So. Yeah. And I'd love to, as we go through this episode, dig into how you can match your core values with organization as well. I think that'd be really powerful. Mm-hmm. And before we get there, I'd love to hear for what reasons should people care about core values? Why, why would someone start to look into this work? Well, core values will reveal things about you and will help you understand yourself. They will reveal you to, if you understand them, then they will reveal you to other people, but they will also point out and uncover and hmm, expose, shall we say, yeah. the, I, I use the, another term, an acronym of the ABCs. They will expose your assumptions, beliefs, and conditioning that you have not yet examined. They will, I find too, that it's very interesting. They will line up with your disc personality type with if you're an Enneagram person or human design, when you start putting all of these pieces together, they will start to really fill in like a 360, like global view of who you really are. And you may not be somebody, I I can't imagine somebody listening to your podcast and not being this way, but you might not be someone who needs that kind of view of yourself, but I did. (laughs) And so what it has done for me is It's helped me to look back throughout my entire life and say, oh, now I understand why at three years old, I didn't want my parents telling me what to do or to tie my shoes for me. I can do it myself. And it's because my top core value is freedom. And it doesn't mean that it's freedom of like, well, it started out on that very first list, girl. It was the very top one was freedom. I don't have a job. And, you know, they, every entrepreneur goes with there, right? But I have come to understand that for me, it's freedom of thought. It's free to, the freedom to think for myself, to have my own ideas, to, to have my own unique expressions. My husband, like I said, we've almost been married 30 years, has learned that he just does not start sentences with, wouldn't you agree that fill in the blank? I'm like, well, oh, no. Okay. And that used to make me really angry. Well, and here's the thing. There's, there's three main things that understanding your core values will do for you. Number one, they will explain you to yourself. Um, they will help you define your boundaries. They will enrich your, your relationships. And they will reduce your stress. Mm-hmm. Okay. Other than knowing yourself, they will, do, they will do those main things. Because the stress and the tension that comes from not understanding that freedom of thought was my top core value. And having my husband say, wouldn't you agree that? X, Y, Z. How do I answer that? There is no possible way to answer that and honor him and me at the same time. There just isn't. And so my mother, um, who we lost in 2017, to, and that was another catalyst that kind of really put me on this road of becoming a transformational leadership coach. My mother would, bless her heart, say, isn't this pretty? I mean, just that, just something that small And people don't understand, well, Andrea, can't you just agree? I'm like, well, actually, I thought it was really ugly, but I love my mother. So what am I supposed to say? So that sounds like piddly little things. But when you do that over and over and over in your day, and then year after year after year, you end up like me with bulimia and depression in in a 12-week inpatient program or at 310 pounds needing gastric bypass surgery. Those are the kinds of things that happen when you don't honor who you are and you don't learn how to set internal boundaries that are gracious and that make it very clear to other people without having to put the hand up 
and without having to be rude about them and without having to argue or defend them, when people really know who you are, I mean, I'll bet everybody listening to this has a friend that they can say, oh, that's just so-and-so, right? That's just how they are, right? I would say that's probably someone who already lives in alignment with their core values, whether or not they know what they are. Yeah. But most of us, if we don't know what they are, cannot live in alignment with them because we are in an environment that may not honor them. So that's why it's important for us to know what they are so that we can build our own boundaries, enrich our relationships, and reduce the amount of stress and tension that we have in our lives. There is so much that I would love to unpack there. The <laughs> last thing that I reminded of is there's a, a quote, which I'm not going to even try restate, I'm just going to make up a similar one, is that if you don't choose what your life looks like, your environment will choose it for you. And I think that's yeah. it's similarly aligned because if you don't choose or are consciously aware of your values, you're going to adopt the ones of your environment. And you mentioned right. that there's the three main reasons why someone could want to look at their core values because they help to provide clarity on yourself, your boundaries, and help to reduce stress. Everyone listening to this podcast wants to do that. And yes. so I'd, lo I'd love to hear from you. How do you determine what is important to you or what you think is important to you, but is actually important to someone else? Maybe it's just your conditioning. Mm -hmm. How do you determine mm -hmm. what's actually important to you? Well, the very first place we start is what ticks us off, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, and I even did this with, I was on a um, an interview live radio show and th this gentleman said, the same, and he's, he's great. He was a lot of fun and I hope he invites me back. But he said, so how would I know? And I'm like, well, the very first thing I do is tell people what pissed you off in the last week. Mm. And he said, oh, or, I said, or the last month, you know, it's like some people, you know, some people get ticked off every day. But um, if there was something that you just couldn't let go, what was it that really bothered you? And he, he got really quiet. And this is a very jovial guy, right? I mean, he, I just was very surprised. And we had another, he had another co-host on there. And we both kind of got quiet and he said, you know, this thing happened and this person said, you know, he, he went through it um, on live air. And, um, and I said, okay, so what I'd like to do is to help you switch that around and say, this is what really angered you. So whatever the positive opposite is of that is probably a really good starting point. And for him, it was kind of a, a, a belief in himself or somebody that would believe him. And I said, so then I would take that and start digging down and saying, well, is it that, that they need to trust you or that they need to respect you or that? And so I have lists and lists of words that I help people work through. But figuring out what really angers you very much will start you on the right path. I even had a situation that I've shared with all of my close friends because it was such terrible customer service at a local department store here. And um, because the customer is always right, right? right? I mean, this was a deal where the customer was not right. And they held up a, a little scanner and said, this isn't the price, lady. And <laughs> I need out of this situation. And I was so like, I don't get this way very much anymore. But as I was, I needed to buy the things. And so I was walking out of the store and on my way to the car, I was just kind of jerking and shaking. <laughs> and I think the thing that really set me off was she looked at me and she said, well, did you read the sign well? And I thought, oh my gosh, she insulted me in front of like 20 people. And I looked at her and I smiled her face and I said, well, I think I did. And, you know, by this time I'm like, if my, if my husband didn't need this shirt, I would leave the store. And so I had to get in the car because I really, in my younger life, when things would get that heated for me, when something would really, really press on a, a core value of either either freedom of thought or authenticity for me was is another top one. And my third one is belonging. And so um, when something would really press on one of those, I've been known to slam doors and go out in the backyard and throw trash cans and scream and at the moon and that kind of stuff. So anything that gets you that worked up, is a really good indicator that this might be where you want to start. <laughs> that might be. 100%. And I've never actually thought of looking at the stuff that pisses you off because you're right. I normally go straight to the, you know, what makes you proud? What makes you happy? And, and then start elicitating from there. But what makes yeah. you pissed off is such a great place to start. Yeah, because that's when you get into the raw, real stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, because we're going to tell, when I ask people, I'll do workshops. 
And um, I'll say, I'll literally start with, if you tell me that your top core values are family, church, and you know something else, I'm going to say, nope, start over. And because everybody says that. And I live in the evangelical South mm-hmm. in, in the United States. So everybody says like, faith, country, and family, right? <laughs> faith, freedom, and family. And I'm like, okay, pick another yes. because these are the ones that we've, this is where conditioning comes in. Yeah. This is where it really matters. And I, I have a, a graphic that I use of an iceberg for the conditioning, for the ABCs with your assumptions at the very top. And these are the things that you just don't realize. They're up there where everybody else can see them and everybody kind of knows that these are your assumptions, but until they're really challenged, you don't know why. But when people start working on core values, you have to go deep down and you have to like say, well, I have these assumptions. Why do I have them? Oh, I have these beliefs that are like maybe at the waterline or maybe right below the waterline. Well, where did those beliefs come from? Because here's something. People say, well, I believe in this and that's my value. Nope. Beliefs are 100% changeable. Ask anybody who has left a religion, joined a religion, changed political parties. Beliefs are changeable. So I, I don't, I push back on that. I'm a little sassy. Um, and then, then, but when we really do the hard work and we really look down at our conditioning, that tells us a lot about whether the values are coming at us or coming from us. And that's another distinction. Is this a value that's coming at me or from me? And when, when anything that's outside of me is not my core value, it's something that I value. And if you want to use the core word and say, because I'm not going to argue with you about semantics, right? It's like, if you want to use that core value word for business values, these are the core values of the business. That's fine. Those are not my core values. Mm -hmm. My core values are only in here and they don't have anything to do with out there except for how I treat you and how I expect you to treat me. That's the only thing they have to do with it. And so my experience with core values, and I'd love to delve more into yours as well. Um, I came across the need to identify core values because I didn't feel like I was living life in alignment. I wasn't feeling fulfilled. I was achieving things and I just wasn't feeling fulfilled with those achievements. So I was like, okay, let's figure out what's important to me. And I pulled up a list. I didn't even know what a value was. So I Googled what's a list of core values. And then a website Mm -hmm. set up 50 of them. And I was looking at them Mm -hmm. going, hmm, okay, well, I think I should value things like love and Mm. connection. Like those are things that everyone should value, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so needless to say, this process didn't work out for me because I just, I mean, those things are important to me, but they're not my, my top values. And so I'd be interested to hear from you as well. What, what words would you consider first and foremost values? So for example, I know people will say something like I value family and I'm like, I don't feel like family is a core value. I think family represents something, which is a core value. So how would you define, how would you know that you've landed on a core value in terms of what's important to you? So I have a, um, and I'm going to share this later, like this is for, for your audience, there's an exercise to walk through and it'll explain this as well. But um, I like to say that core values are, um, you can see the results of them, but they're intangible. Okay. So they're not like family there because that's tangible, right? Yeah. So it doesn't meet that. So it's, it's intangible. They are things that motivate you. They are things that bring you joy. They are things that are kind of your non-negotiables. You know, you have, you have, do you have a friend who says, you lie to me and you're dead to me? (laughs) Do you have any, I mean, somebody's got a friend out there that is like, if you know full well that if that person has ever lied to you, they will, you will not have a relationship with me. That's a core value of honesty. Yeah. Right. And the other thing about core values is that they're not one way. They're not just me acting in freedom it's like i expect you to re- to give me the the ability to think for myself as well right so they're reciprocal they're always reciprocal um i had a conversation last week with a gentleman and he said yeah it's respect is i've i've done this exercise before i said great and he said um but i just kind of confirmed that respect is my top core value and i said tell me how that shows up and this is in front of a whole group of people and he said i have to respect you therefore and he said, because of my core value, I will respect you. Therefore, I will demand respect from you. And he said, if I don't get it, I will walk away. And I said, that, that's a core value, right? Yeah. And I help you work it down to like 10. And then, you know, if you can get it to top three, that's great. Some people have five, um, but it can take years to truly figure it out. 
like I said, I started with nine and some of them were like, one was beauty. I celebrate beauty and all things. So I value beauty, right? It's like, and I don't mean like physical beauty. I mean like at nature, I love being outside and, you know, those kinds of things. And it also, I, I will say this, when you start working in your values and you start understanding that'll help you understand your guiding principles, these are what, that's what I would just say they are. They're your guiding principles. Then it helps you to also understand the and see the the beauty and the uniqueness of other people because you realize we don't all have the same core values. They're all different for a reason. We're all made differently. We're wired differently. And it it helped helps me give other people grace, right? I can see in my in my husband that he really wants that connection. I, he won't do the core values exercise, but <laughs> I don't really know. But at the same time, I know that I need to sit and listen when he needs to explain something to me. And my son really values the, um, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't put a, a name on it yet, but he likes to share things that he thinks are funny. And he really, really, really wants me to think things are funny with him. He's 14. So um, I've learned that whether or not I think they're funny, I'll just look at him every once in a while and go, do you just need me to say this is funny? Yes, ma'am. I'm like, all right then. You know, I mean, because I value the relationship with him, but I also am honoring my freedom and, val and, and value of authenticity. So um, being willing to look at things that are intangible. So words that you might use are things like honesty or integrity, uh, freedom or freedom of thought. Um, I had one client that I just worked through with her. She said, um, it's, it's a team player. And I was like, it's not, that's not a core value. <laughs> And so then I, we kind of got it down to what does it mean? And we'll define it. And your definition of that word is going to be a little nuanced from the dictionary, right? So we defined it. It turned out it was really more team oriented. And because um, she wanted, it was for the betterment of everyone, but she wanted everybody to, to want to be there. Because when you're a team player, it's almost like you have to go around and knock people on the head to make sure they all do their part. And she's like, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I said, well, tell me more. And then we kind of worked through it. And so I, I have a list it's, that I, is in this free exercise that's three pages long with three, three or four columns, single spaced. And you can also, it's, it's not terrible to Google words. Like love can be a core value. It's just usually something different. It's usually something deeper. Um, as an example, I thought community was a core value. Turns out. It wasn't so much that I needed community. It was that I needed belonging. Mm -hmm. And when I stated earlier that they tend to overlap with our disc types and our Enneagram types and our human design and all that, do you know those? Are you familiar with all of those systems or no? I am a sucker for a good personality profile. Um, so, yes, I've got human yeah, design, I, Enneagram, disc. I've, I've done it all. Okay. And I'd love to talk yeah. more about that. So, yeah, let's go. <laughs> So let's just talk Enneagram. I'm an Enneagram six wing seven and I am a counterphobic. So I do not like authority, which is not a surprise when I'm a free thinker, right? So, um, but I tried to play in that and that was where all of my attention came from is I tried to follow all the rules. Um, but the six, I just, we're in a study in my church and it's um, about how Enneagram, how we relate to each other. And part of that's just building up the body in the church, you know, how we relate to each other. And one of the things that was brought out and I've studied the Enneagram for like three years. It was like, one of the things the sixes really, really need is belonging. And I'm like, oh gosh, yes, that's my thing. No, my core value. Well, I guess maybe part of it is just who, it just shows you, this is like confirming, this is who I am, right? So um, I love watching them layer on top of each other. Because I'm a DISC consultant, I do DISC with all of my clients, either corporate clients or one-on-one -on -one coaching clients first. That is the first thing we do. And then I have them do the core values exercise. And when they come back, and I also have a specific coaching, hybrid coaching pilot that I'm doing where we only work on core values. And they do, I have a digital course, they walk through that. And then we, we meet four times or six times, depending on how many they need. And we work really intensively on core values. Um, but what's really fun to watch with my clients who go with DISC first is to then lay out their DISC analysis and say, all right, so if I'm an I, which is the, um, the oh gosh, inspirational, because I am, I'm a I, which is like, where's the word? It's late here. It must be early where you are. Um, and it's on a Friday. Um, but 
which tells you my eyes like taking over. I'm like, I'm the inspirational and influencer in me really does like that authenticity and to be fun and to be connected with people. So all of those things, when they, when you layer them uh, on top of each other, it really kind of paints a good picture for you to be able to, to figure those things out. And that gives you, I don't know, I, I, I know I went a long way around the, the horn there, but, um, back to the words, that kind of gives you an idea of the kind of things we're looking for. Yeah. And I, I love that you brought up the tools because during that period of my life where I was getting really interested in core values, I was doing every test. Like I mentioned, I can't remember what my Enneagram is, but it's been some time now, but I was pulling up everything. I was just trying to make sense of myself and what makes me happy and what where what my purpose was, where I should go with my life and all that sort of stuff. And And so I've done all these different tests and what I would love to hear your thoughts on is I, I feel like sometimes you can have a relationship with a tool where you go, the tool says I'm this, so I am mm-hmm. this and I can't act outside mm-hmm. of it. And you can almost use it as a crutch. It, it, I definitely yeah. saw that when I was first using the tools. And I think since then I've used it, those sort of tools as a guiding principle. So for example, in human design, I'm a manifester. And so I was like, oh. yes, I love initiating stuff. How cool is this? This is why I can't stick to projects long-term. I'm just not going to do long-term projects. I'm going to have a conversation with my mm. boss going, no, I'm not not responsible for things long-term. I'll do like projects with tight deadlines or I'll create a project and move on. And so I think there's value in understanding those tools and understanding yourself, but I'd love to hear what's a resourceful relationship and what potentially an unresourceful relationship with these sorts of mm. tools. Well, I'm a pure generator, 6'3 generator. So I love the back and forth. Like, this is why I love conversations. It's like, oh, I can bounce off of that. Um, so as a disc consultant, so I started young. I was, um, my very first was like Myers-Briggs way, way, way long time ago. And I've done all of them. And I, I love them because they give me a new language. And I think that's the word I would like to use. And actually, my human design coach uses that language. So it's just a language that we can use to help describe ourselves and help understand ourselves. And I completely understand the wanting, the desire to understand yourself. When I did the Myers-Briggs, the very first, it was the very first one I did. And the book that accompanies the Myers-Briggs is called Please Understand Me. If I said, oh, they wrote this book for me. Um, but when we take a tool and have it, have it do something it's not meant to do, it becomes useless. Just like if you have a regular toolbox, I'm, I'm the girl with the toolbox, right? I, I, the, the power saw is mine, the head trimmers are mine, the hammer is mine, but I don't take my hammer, like tomorrow I have to prune my, and I have to really get them pruned back for the winter, I have to prune my forsythias. I just love them in the spring, but they, I planted them too close to the road. So I have to use the hedge trimmers and prune them all back. If I take my hammer out there, it's no good. Or if I say, um, the only tool I can use out here is the hedge trimmers, but the reality is some of those branches are really thick and they need a good pruner then I'm not using, I'm, I'm letting the tool define what I'm doing. So when we think of a, any particular tool as something that is the only answer, then we are misusing it because um, a lighthouse, is another good example, has windows. Very few of them have like round windows. They all have like just a bunch of straight windows, right? Well, when you look in one straight window, it's like you see things. But then if you look over here or if you look out of it, you see something different. So we need to be able to see ourselves from these different angles and understanding that the facets look different from the different angles that are coming in. And, the, and that's why I like the more we do them the, and the more tools we use, then the more clarity we get on what's inside. Like I, I think I'm going to land on, I've, I've put five analogies out there. I think I'm going to land on the, the stone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and just say, you know, if we have a, an emerald cut only has a few cuts on it, but a princess cut diamond has so many. So, you know, we don't, we don't want to look at it and say, oh, well, it's just a point. No, it's not. It has all these different facets. We have to be willing to walk around and look at it from all the different angles. And um, if we let any tool define us, we are doing ourselves a great disservice. Even core values, they have to be flex. You have to be flexible enough to be willing to change them. Like for me, going from, even in my digital courses, like says, I said in there, community is one of my top three core values. And now I'm like, oh no, it's belonging. And, but it's just drilled down. I was in a 
a meeting yesterday, they were talking about mission and purpose and Nike has changed their mission and, and vision because not much, they just put an asterisk in there where it says um, something to the effect of enabling athletes or whatever to do their, what, to be the best they can be. And then they put an asterisk by athlete. And then down below it says, if you have a body, you're an athlete. And so you need to have enough room in there to learn more about yourself because the reality is we only know what we know when we know it. So we can only go as deep as we can go when we can go. And at 57, I can go a lot deeper than I could when I was 30. So I need to be willing to have the tools in my toolbox to use at any given time, pull out the human design for this com conversation, pull out the Enneagram for that, pull out the DISC for that, the Myers-Briggs for that, and be willing, and the core values kind of at any other time, be able to say, these tools serve me, I don't serve them. Oh, I love that. These <laughs> tools serve me, I don't serve them. And so I feel like, I feel like I might know what your response might be to this, but if someone is like, Andrea, what, what tool should I use? I want to understand myself. What tool should I use first? What does it depend on the person in the situation? It, it does depend on the person in the situation. It might depend on what they're looking for, right? If somebody came to me and said, um, I have a lot of anxiety over my past. I don't understand. Um, I, I, I don't understand myself. It's like, well, maybe you should look at the Enneagram because it's a little it's a little squishy and, you know, it's like, it, it, no, you can't really take a test to be it, it, at any, to figure out your Enneagram type. It's something that understands your own motivations or I don't know why I do what I do. But if you are in a work situation or a family situation where you feel like I'm, I'm speaking different languages, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. like, it's as if I'm the only one speaking English in this house or in my, in my job. It's like, let's just do the disc and let's figure out how everybody communicates because as Maxwell says, everybody communicates, but few connect. And so what we want to do is help you learn the language of the different people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, if I, I, I think human design for me was a really good plug filler. <laughs> it just like filled all the gaps. Myers-Briggs helps you understand um, your energy levels, where you get your energy from. For an introvert, I need it at home. I need to be quiet and I need to have fill up time. But for an extrovert, they need to be out and around people. So depending on what you're looking for, I would say if you're willing to do the research, what are you looking for and find the test or the typing or whatever that actually does that? It's interesting. I have on my list of podcast episodes that I'm doing, it's called to type or not to type. Cool. And um, yeah, so, um, so I'll be kind of walking through this exact conversation in that podcast episode in the spring. I love that. Because it's, uh, yeah, because it's easy to say, well, if they just give me this answer. Yeah. Are you looking externally because you're avoiding asking yourself the internal questions, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so just circling back to core values specifically for a moment, it, even hearing you talk about the word freedom, t to me, it sounds like, and, and you also mentioned that the, the dictionary definition of a word could be different to what is valued to you. And so what I'm mm -hmm. taking from this as well is we all have different things that we value and even the word itself we could have different interpretations of that word have I got that correct yeah. yes and part of the exercise I walk people through is that exact thing you need to define the word for you and you could even put it into a um, myth does this because or this is what you know and you can actually t I've had some clients take their core their top three to five core values and make a sentence out of them and so that they'll remember what they are and everybody does it a little bit differently, but when I'm kind of working, a friend I'm working with right now, she handed me, she says, these are my top five. And I'm like, well, there's actually like 20 here because you've put like four words on each line. <laughs> and she goes, I know, but they go together. I'm like, well, then here's the deal. One of those is the word and the rest of them are the definition of the word, you know, because you can put things like honesty, integrity, trust, all these on the same line. And the reality is it may be that it's a trustworthiness because you've proven that you have the integrity that you need to be my friend or be in my inner circle because you've always been honest with me. So it's like figuring out those kinds of definitions. 
And I sit here with clients like on a Zoom call and I hit Google and I just say, what's the definition of this word? What's the definition of this word? And sometimes we'll dive a little deeper because we also, believe it or not, don't always know what a word actually means. Totally. I spend a lot of my time actually Googling the word going, I want to be really intentional with my language because I understand the power of it. So I will Google the definition yes. of words. <laughs> I'm a word girl. And yeah. I'm, I get nerdy about it. Yeah. And I do a, a word of the day every day. I used to actually put them on Instagram and my stories and stuff. And finally, I'm like, no, I think I just need to do this for myself. But if you go back through my Instagram feed, you're going to find them. And I find that um, that is the best way to make myself be intentional. And whenever I want to find a new one, I just look at the synonyms and antonyms and and figure out how I want to show up today. And so I do that on a daily basis. But when I walk my clients through, it's like, have you been to Google yet? Have you, you know, you could go to Oxford or the dictionary or the Webster's. I don't care where you go, but you need to see what the, because some words have three or four definitions. In working, I have a coach friend, we trade stuff off. Mm -hmm. And today we were talking about, I, I wanted we were talking about in teams, people, I just need to be an implementer and, or, and she said, what about an executor? And I'm like, what's the difference? <laughs> and then we went and looked them up. And because an implementer is someone who takes the visionary's plan, it takes the vision and makes a plan and puts the plan in motion. And the executor takes the plan and executes it. And I'm like, oh, and then, you know, realizing, realizing how those things really are different if we're not willing to do that when it comes down to how we identify ourselves, because if you don't really get your core values nailed down, you won't, it won't help you. It won't. And, you know, I have some people who kind of rush through the thing and, and they're, they're, they don't want to look deep. And that's one of the things I address all the time is why don't we want to look deep? Well, it's because it's going to show you some things, but nothing you learn about yourself is bad. Hmm. Nothing. Nothing you learn about who you are designed as a person is bad. I've shared, I'm a missionary kid and a pastor's wife. I believe we're all created in, in the image of our creator. And it's, it's like a fingerprint on it. It's this beautiful. Every single person is created with this infinite difference from the person next to them. Why on earth would you not want to know that? And so these are, this is where the conditioning comes in. We have to say, why wouldn't you want to know that? right? This is something that could help you be the best you. And if you don't want to do that, I want to know. I'm curious. I want to know why, right? Because the more people we put out there who are comfortable in themselves, the less defensiveness we'll have, the less, you know, I mean, this, we could make the world a better place. I mean, and that's, a, yes, but it's real, right? It, we, we change our environments one person at a time. And when we feel strong in our in who we are, then we can actually make that difference in our communities. Hundred percent agree, and it reminds me of a quote that I heard in a podcast just the other day. It was something along the lines of, "We're not here to make someone else's desires a reality. We're here to make out our own desires a reality." And that's how we start living our purpose. And just hearing what you have to share connect me with that because I think too often we feel like we're doing the right thing by doing what we think everyone else expects of us or what we think everyone else wants. When in reality, if we asked someone if they want us to be happy long-term, they would say yes. I think short-term, they might want us to do something that makes them happy. But if you were to ask them, hey, long-term, do you want me to be happy? They would say yes. And then mm -hmm. what makes you happy is doing the things that align with your core values. Absolutely. And I shared a little while ago that we did lose my mom back in 2017. And you, you know, I said, I've come from this evangelical culture where it's like, please think for yourself, but choose from these approved answers, you know, so it's like, <laughs> and, you know, I, it, it, there's a whole other thing in that. But um, my mother did not know what to do with what we would, I was called the strong-willed child. And my mother was just this bubbly, happy woman. And she was very sanguine, very, she'd walk in a room and everybody'd go, Judy, you know. And um, yet she just didn't know what to do with me because I was so different. And she said things to me and it, when, you know, when you're a kid and I remember certain things and the closer she got to the end, the more, I mean, she really worked hard. I mean, I spent, I had years of depression, antidepressants. I, I went through a lot and I made her go to counseling. <laughs> it's like, you're going. And um, at first she didn't want to. But she got to the place where she realized, you know what, you're breaking these 
you're breaking this. Sorry, the, my, my Southern Texas came out. You're breaking the cycle. Um, and she's like, you're breaking that, and I want to help. And even at the very end, she, she would use the phrase, fly, be free. And we would use like the butterfly or, you know, something like that um, as, a, as a metaphor. But she would say, have I apologized enough? Did I tell you how much I'm proud of you? Did I tell you how much? Because your, your concept that you just put out there of people want us to do in the now what makes them happy. She wanted in the now to have children that followed along like the little <laughs> partridge family. Is that the two old? Yep, that's um, the thing. She wanted, you know, um, she wanted two little girls to follow along and to be the perfect little girls. And I just wasn't. I just couldn't be that kid. And part of it was I was just, my brain worked too fast. I was too smart. And, um, and I, it's not that I made fabulous grades. It's just I can figure things out. Like I said, I'm a six. So I can figure things out that are going to happen down there. And I can tell you, mm -mm, you shouldn't do that. And she just, um, it took her a long time to realize that she wanted me to be happy, not to be a obedience not the right word not to follow in her footsteps not to be her clone she wanted me to be happy and I realized that I lost her at 50 and I said I don't want to be that I don't want to look back and say I wish I had or to my one son my only child because I went to early menopause so we adopted my son 14 years into our marriage and I didn't want to say he was only eight years old when she died and I didn't want to say to him did I apologize to you enough? <laughs> I just want you to be happy. I wanted to learn how to do that now, right? Mm -hmm. And for you who are young and the, I hope your listeners are young as well, I want especially women to understand this because I think women get this message early, early on. And I'm, I'm learning too that, that men get this message, boys get this message early on that we have to conform to something to be good. We have to conform to something to be acceptable. And this body positivity and body consciousness and is, a, is helping, but it doesn't change what's in our brains. Mm -hmm. I used to weigh 310 pounds. I had gastric bypass surgery. I, this was almost 20 years ago. I still walk by mirrors and don't recognize myself. Mm -hmm. Our brains are really, really, really powerful things. And the conditioning that we have is more powerful than anything else. And so to to say, I, I want to know my core values in order to be able to live my life authentically and powerfully and with lots of impact in my family and my community. And whether or not, you know, I would love to coach the next, you know, president of the United States because she's a woman, right? Like something like that. And if that's a big goal or if it's I want to I wanna influence the next generation by being the kind of mother or the, the aunt that I could be. That's, that's what I want people to understand about core values is it's really just being true to who you are. Mm. That's really what it is. And with that definition of being true to who you are, do you think that core values can evolve and change over time or does the flavor of them change? So before you mentioned that you, you thought community was one when in reality it was actually probably val uh, belonging that you valued most. What's your thoughts on, on core values and their ability to change or evolve? So I'm going to answer that in a little bit of a roundabout way, but that shouldn't surprise you anymore. Um, <laughs> you should be, this is what you should expect from me. Um, just like we talked earlier about how we start with the outside and work in, I think our core values start there too. Um, I started with my personal growth journey over 30 years ago with figuring out processes and making sure that I had good systems down and was a good journaler and I read all the personal growth books and I attended seminars and I, I got skills for my job and I raised myself up and, you know, I, I did 25 years in university settings. And those were all outside me. Those were outside things. But until I started working inside, the real changes didn't happen, right? I can get all the certifications. I can get all the skills. I can um, be there long enough to say I have the most seniority and working at great universities here on the East Coast and yet not be aware of who I am. And therefore, what I have is kind of hollow. So it's okay to realize that, like I said a minute ago, we know what we know when we know it and am comfortable with working out here 
And then I move it inside, move it inside. Eventually something's going to crack you open and you're going to have to do it. So you might as well. And for me, maybe that full cracking open, I think, was when my mother died. And so being able to say, okay, now I'm really willing to look at what's inside. So when you're willing to do that, that's when it all happens. So can they change? No, I don't think they do. But I liked your word flavor. I think that the flavor is what changes. The way I would describe it is working from the outside in on a um, a rubber band ball or something. It's like, yep, this is a ball of rubber bands, but in the middle is something else. You know, as you pull them off, it's like they're all yellow and then they're all green and then they're all blue. Wait a minute, but it's still the ball of rubber bands. And then you get down to the fact that they're all just like that terrible fleshy color. <laughs> but um, so I think that the flavor changes and I think the more we know each other, the deeper we go um, and or the more we know ourselves, the deeper we can go. And so it, it belonging for me still shows up in the desire to be in community. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not that it is a completely changed one. It just is a more clear and concise and precise definition of what that core value was. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like as you keep going through this work and experimenting and just adding more color and clarity to what that yes. word means to you because it's going to mean something different to someone else as well. Well, and as you grow and as you learn about yourself and the, as you experience things, then it's it's like adding spices to the soup pot, right? It's like you just get more and more and more and then it becomes this robust understanding and this really, um, I don't know, savory thing that you can say, oh yeah, this is who I am. And for me, the authenticity one is there, but I haven't gone that deep on that one. The freedom and the belonging, I've gone much deeper. So we'll see where authenticity gets us in the next few years. <laughs> it's such yeah. a fun project to work on. <laughs> and and so yeah, I'm is. interested to hear from you as well. If someone's got that list of maybe, let's go five core values. So like, Andrea, I've got my five, these, these are it. How can someone start to try them on or just confirm to themselves that these are the ones that are actually their core values? What does that look like? Um, I actually have people take out like a notebook and, and put part of the exercise that I'll share with you um, has this idea that you take them for a spin, right? And you could take them for a spin for six months if you want. But if you write at the top of each page, um, your top, you know, this is freedom and authenticity and connection or whatever. And then just kind of, or a little bitty one that you can keep with you. I have a bunch of this size, right? These little bitty ones. Um, you can tell I do this a lot because I have them available. Um, keep that with you, like if in your pocket or in your purse or wherever. And every time something either um, triggers it, like steps on it, or you find yourself saying, oh, this is, this makes me really mad. They didn't let me think for myself. Like, oh, I'm going to write that down and put a date by it and what it was and how angry it made you. Or if it's something like, hey, this was a beautiful experience. And I realized it was because I got to figure it out for myself. That's a whole, that's an opposite. That's a positive one. Write it down. This is, this is a project. You should be a project for the rest of your life. Now, not everybody's going to want to do that, but I say, take them out for a spin and plug them in and see how they work. The other thing you can do is Use them as a filter for your decision-making process, right? So if you need to make a career change, how is this going to affect core value number one, number two, or number three? Sometimes they need to change order because of the kind of decision that you're making. Um, The other thing is I, I definitely encourage people to employ them in order to understand your own inner boundaries. And once you do that, then you will have a whole lot less stress. There will be plenty of people who are not happy with you, but it will be much easier to even navigate those people who are unhappy. Um, so for, for taking them, I do say that. I say, take them out for a spin, four to, you know, anywhere from four days to four months. Just enjoy them and write them down and then go back through that data and look at it and, and say, because this is not all touchy-feely, y'all. This can be, this can be purely data-driven if that's who you are. And if you go back through all of that data and say, huh, this one that I had as number two, it only over the last three months, I've only like three times written something down. But this one I had as number five, I had to go two pages, right? I think that one needs to go up here. And so the others can go down the list. And it doesn't mean that they're not something that's important to you, but they can just fall down the list and that's okay. Yeah, I think that 
taking them for a spin. I love that analogy. Um, and I think it also gives you permission to try them on. Like I think a lot of people, when they commit yes. to something, they think it's permanent and that there's yep. some really drastic long-term consequences. Just taking them for a spin, just trying them on. You can take it off at any moment. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's a really great approach. And and so on that too, I mean, maybe this is a whole other podcast episode, but I feel like once you have your core values, and I, I'd love to use the example of a workplace because m- many of us spend sure. so many hours of our time there. Personally, I, I believe it's unrealistic that we go, I need to find a workplace that has my core values because I think mm-hmm. as we've elicited, everyone's combination is different. So that's unrealistic to think that your core values are going to match your organizations or I don't think they also should be your businesses. That's a whole other thing too. But right. I would love to hear your thoughts. How would you ensure that your core values at least align with an organization or how would you feel that you can make sure that your core values and, and needs are being met by an organization? Mm-hmm. I like to use the word honored. Can they be honored in this situation? Can I live with them? Because I, like I said, I worked for two, well, three higher education, but two on the East Coast. I worked for Johns Hopkins University in their medical school, in their oncology center. And then I worked for the University of Virginia in research administration and operations. And so I am very well aware of all of the different mission and vision and values of educational institutions. And one of the things that is not necessarily a value of an educational institution is to have all of our employees think for themselves. <laughs> so true. Freedom of right? thought. <laughs> yeah. Now, in their students, they want that. But in their employees, they need a machine that runs really well. These are like huge. The University of Virginia is the largest employer in the state of Virginia outside of the state of Virginia. Like the state is the largest employer. The next is the University of Virginia. So, and this is, a very historic university here. It's the Thomas Jefferson who like penned the Declaration of Independence. It's a big deal. And for their students, they want that. But for their employees, they need people who can keep the ship afloat. They need to make, it's a giant organization. And I was in the School of Medicine. And so there's regulations for clinical trials and all the research that we do. And so I found myself in in this box of having to not only stay within the regulations, but enforce regulations. And that made a lot of tension in my life. But what I found was I could find ways in which I could allow my freedom of thought to come out in how I dealt with my staff and how I managed my staff. I did it differently than everybody else and how I related to the physicians that I worked with. And it it showed up in my authenticity and I would have researchers come sit in my office and and talk to me and and talk about their research and and how they were afraid they wouldn't be able to get these this grant and it literally I had one guy who was a brilliant like he would be what we would call a rock star a researcher he showed up when I had turned in my notice and he said who am I going to talk to <laughs> this is how I found a way in that environment to be me yeah they knew I was me They knew I would enforce the rules. They knew I would, like, even if they're HR rules or the regulations for clinical trials or how we collect data or, you know, procurement, whatever, (laughs) finance, um, they knew I would do that. But they also knew that they could come to me as a person. and I was a safe place because I was was creating a space of belonging. I was creating a space of authenticity. And they knew that I would give them what I thought, right? So – I don't think it's so much if if you're in an environment where you literally are in conflict with the values of yeah. the institution, you need to find someplace else to be. But I was able in that kind of an institution to find a way to be myself while still maintaining their values of excellence and, you know, all that kind of stuff that institutions do. And so I think it's that's the part that's real tricky. But especially if you're with a smaller organization, I spoke with a woman yesterday who's in banking and she said they changed the values in the the way they're going to deal with customers and the things that were important. And she said, I realized even though I thought I was going to devote the rest of my life to this bank, Mm -hmm. I decided I needed to find something else. And she went to a smaller community bank because for her, it was all about the customer. And so she stayed within banking. She's a branch manager, and yet she found a way to honor her core values and her why, if you want to say, while staying in the institutions that she was familiar with or with the type of work that she was familiar with. So 
I think it's unrealistic, like you said, to think that we can align business values with our core values. It's how do we honor our core values in the work that we do? And I think that's a better question. And when you start asking that question, you get, oh, and you're curious about it and willing to not just be upset that your values might be getting stomped on by so-and-so over in procurement. Um, If you're willing to have that curious question, you can, it'll help you figure out where you need to be and how you need to show up. I love how you've said the word honored. And even hearing that when you go, how can I honor my values and and make sure I, I guess, for lack of a better term, still play by the rules of the organization and and align with their values. I also immediately feel like I've got more options too, because I can choose how my values are honored, right? Like I don't need to go work for one organization. I can work for a multitude of different organizations and how I honor them could look different in each situation. I still have all these options despite my unique core value skill set. Yeah. Yes. And because not all of us are in entrepreneurs, right? It's like, I had to learn that. It's like, when I became an entrepreneur, I'm like, oh, you need to be, you need to quit. You need to be an entrepreneur. It's like, no, not everybody is that way. And so even just helping people understand who they are, I love the way you put that. It gives me a lot more options to say, how can I, how can I honor in this organization or this institution, how I can show up? And I think that's the key. And that will make you a better employee. It will make you a better boss. It will make you a better team player or a team member. It will make you a better parent. It will make you a better everything when you say, in order to honor my core values, how do I want to do that? That will make you a better everything. I think on that note, you've provided so many tips and tools and insights into core values today. And I'd love to finish off by asking you, what's a really actionable step the audience can take in the next 24 to 48 hours to start getting crystal clear clarity on their core values? Well, you know, I'm going to say you could just start. Um, I have a simple downloadable and I've made a, a special link for your people. And uh, you're going you're to put that in the show notes, but I believe it's uh, theintentionaloptimist.com forward slash actually. Um, it's kind of the season for that. Love actually, right? Um, but if you just are willing to take that step, take that, just if, you, if, if you're willing to just open the paper and say, how can I do this? Pull out a notebook and start writing them down. I did it with like a notepad and just kind of just wrote and wrote and wrote for pages and pages. And then I started consolidating them down into what I wanted to actually play with. I think that is the very best thing you can do for yourself. It's a gift, right? We're going into the holidays where, yeah, it's going to be really, really busy, but at, and I don't know when this will be released, but um, we're recording this right before most of the holidays. And there will be some quiet time. There will be some time off work. There will be some time off school if you're in college or university. And you can take that time and devote it to yourself and give yourself that gift for 2024 of discovering and uncovering is what I call it, uncovering your core values. I love that. And it is middle of November and this will be released before the Christmas season because I think it's so important, as you mentioned, using this quiet time or this catalyst for reflection and planning for a lot of people to look at some of this work. So a lot of the episodes and guests I have the pleasure of speaking with are all around these sorts of reflection topics because it's the optimal time, in my opinion, for it. Um, mm-hmm. We're starting mm-hmm. to plan the new years and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yes, I definitely think that is an incredible step, just being willing and open to take that first step. And I know you have some incredible tools to help that on your site as well. And so if someone is keen to learn more about the work that you do, apart from checking out this site, how else can they keep in touch with you? Well, I do have a podcast as well. It's called Stand Tall and Own It, and it's on all the different platforms. And I, I spent three years interviewing amazing leaders, female leaders, and those are all in the back episodes. Um, But what I did in that was I learned that a lot of what we were, and this is kind of going back to the core values thing, what we were when we were a child is what we end up finally, if we're really true to ourselves, becoming in, in our later lives. And so I learned a lot of amazing stuff there. But now with this new iteration starting in September of, of 23, it's really all about owning who I am and owning how we can do this together. So I just, I shared earlier, I just recorded an episode on expectations, how they, if they're unrealized or un, unrecognized, they lead to disappointment. So there's a lot of tips and tricks in there. Um, I'm on Insta and uh, I'm, I'm also very active on LinkedIn and I do have a YouTube channel. So uh, theintentionaloptimist.com forward slash links will get you anywhere. And I'd, I'd love to, uh, you can also email me at andrea at theintentionaloptimist.com if you have any questions. So. Awesome. I'll put all those juicy details in the show notes so you can access them there. But thank you so much, Andrea, for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure to connect with you. And I always feel really privileged to be able to connect with such 
experts in their fields. And I really enjoyed today's chat. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of the Actually You Can podcast. I so enjoy having you here and I hope you've taken away powerful insights and tools that will support you to achieve your high level results. Now, before you go apply all of this wisdom in your life, I'd be so grateful if you are able to leave us a podcast review on the platform that you're listening to or share this episode with a friend. Your support means that we can help more self-led, high-performing individuals just like you expand what's possible for them. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So please go on and shoot me a note on socials and let me know what you think. You can find me on Instagram at Miff Galloway. Now, go ahead and make those dreams a reality because actually you can.